adventure games have been telling stories for decades. But after all those decades of telling stories, they're still not especially good at it. Even today, the adventure game isn't very good at dealing with some of the basic fundamentals of storytelling, things like pacing, character development, emotional arcs. And the problem isn't a lack of ambition or a lack of talent. We know there's been plenty of that. The problem is that we've been thinking about game design in a way that separates gameplay from narrative. It separates what you do from what's going on around you. And uh, so the narrative has to be original, has to be fresh, has to be dynamic. But the gameplay, we think it's enough if the gameplay is repeated from other games with minor variations and then repeated on a loop throughout the game. And what happens when you so utterly divorce the, uh, the craft of making game design from the craft of game writing is that the gameplay and the story are going to clash with each other. Because the gameplay you've inherited has its own needs, which are separate from the needs of your original story. For instance, uh, you might want for your story to have pacing, which changes over time with slow pacing and fast pacing. But you've picked a particular kind of gameplay, which has a particular kind of pacing to it, so your hands are tied. Uh, for another example, you want a character who can grow and change, but a character is d defined by what he does. And what the character is doing is carrying out the regular actions of the gameplay on a loop from the beginning until the end. Where is the room for growth? And you want to have an emotional arc where you're moving from one emotion to another. But the actual emotions that the player feels while playing the game are defined by the gameplay. They're the same emotions which they've felt every time they've played a game with similar gameplay. Of course, there isn't, we don't need to separate gameplay from narrative. I mean, uh, game design is about creating experiences. And what is a story if it isn't a collection of experiences that a character has? So if you understand game design, and you understand your characters and what they're going through, then you should be able to make gameplay which simulates the experiences that the character is having. And that way, the gameplay is not running alongside the narrative. It is there in order to let the player experience the narrative firsthand. I'm going to show you how that works with a number of scenes which I programmed for this occasion, where the gameplay exists to tell a story. Um, and you'll see the, uh, the screenshots on the right side here, in case you have a smartphone handy. And on the left of those, in the brown, you'll see, um, you'll see mock-ups of how the adventure games of today would be more likely to deal with these scenes. And these are not examples of bad game design. They're just examples of stubbornly traditional game design, where instead of finding gameplay that actually suits the nature of the situation, it tries to, to twist the situation into a format that fits the gameplay traditions that we already know. And there are really just two of these. They both date from the 1970s. And most of the adventure games uh, today are still using either the tradition of the text adventure and its descendants or the tradition of the Choose Your Own Adventure book. And both of these are severely restrictive in terms of the kind of storytelling experiences you can create. Now, that may seem strange when I'm talking about Choose Your Own Adventure book. There's barely any interactivity there. I said that, uh, that gameplay had needs. What gameplay, what, what needs could you have with such simplistic gameplay? But it's actually the simplicity of the gameplay that creates the needs, because picking an option out of a list is not in itself going to make your game engaging. You need to have something else. And what that something else is, is that all the player's choices need to matter. And that places severe restrictions on the kind of storytelling you have. It means the pacing needs to be really fast, because you're moving from one major decision to the next with nothing for the player to do in between. It means that the stakes need to be high so that the player always understands that their choices have ramifications. It means the character needs to be perpetually confused about what he's supposed to be doing for the entire duration of the story, or else there's no ambiguity to the choices, and the player feels like their hands are being forced, or forcing an obvious solution. And finally, the plot can't ever be going anywhere too specific, because when you have that much freedom for the, the player to make choices that matter, you need to accommodate a lot of really divergent branching paths. So even if you have a story where all these things don't bother you, you still will want to have particular scenes where the pace slows down or where the character has some sort of idea of what they're doing, and you can't do that as long as you're using a multiple choice interface or something which is derivative of it. The text adventure and the point and click adventure after it have a lot of gameplay, so it doesn't have the simplicity problem, but the gameplay is restrictive in itself. Um, the game, in order to make it engaging, to enter commands, either by typing them in or by selecting objects and or verbs, there need to be obstacles in the way of your figuring out what the right command is for your character to be doing in the story. Uh, generally, that takes the form of three kinds of gameplay, exploration, puzzles, and perception challenges. Why those three kinds? Because they work well in a natural language interface without the player needing to learn a complicated syntax. If you think about it, there aren't that many kinds of gameplay that fit. Uh, and the, I think the, the point-to-click adventure game is mainly just following tradition there. 
it, rather than having an actual reason. And if you say that there's a particular uh, charm to the combination of puzzles, perception challenges, and exploration, I would argue that if you want to make a puzzle, you would make a puzzle game. If you want to make a world, you'd make a dedicated exploration game like Dear Esther or The Path. And if you wanted to make a hidden object game, you would do that. And e in each of those cases, you would have a dedicated audience who would be interested in very special and very sophisticated experiences of that type. But if you put them together, the audiences aren't going to be interested in two-hour-long puzzles. They're going to be interested in seeing the fresh story that ties these elements together. Unfortunately, as I said, the, uh, the storytelling is very limited by the needs of that system because the, the pace needs to be very slow. Every time there's a major action the character takes, there needs to be all these kinds of gameplay that precede it. So it's very slow. The stakes need to be low or else they'll seem out of character for the character to be wandering around, picking things up and examining them and solving puzzles instead of doing what he is actually supposed to be doing. Which leads me to the third thing, which is that the, uh, the character can't have any real motivations. He can't have any drive or he's not going to be able to do all that stuff. And uh, which means you can't have a strong protagonist who's an active player in the story to have your story revolve around. And finally, the overwhelming emotion which the players are going to feel from this experience, regardless of what you tell them is going on in the plot, is disorientation. Because what are they doing for the entire game? They're trying to figure out, what do I do next? That's what all the gameplay revolves around. So regardless of what's going on in the story, they're going to feel lost and disoriented. So we've got these two gameplay traditions, which are still being used today because you can plug so many different kinds of stories into them. But they're not very good at telling diverse kinds of stories. They're good at making specific kinds of experiences. Unfortunately, the, uh, well, fortunately, I should say, adventure game writers um, are not so limited in their ambitions. They want to tell every kind of story and every genre with every kind of protagonist, with every kind of tone. And the gameplay doesn't really support that. So what we've seen over the past few decades is a gradual dilution of the adventure game's interactivity where we still are doing basically the same kinds of things that we were doing in the 1970s, but we're doing less of it. It's easier, it's less involving, it's less complicated to learn, and it is spread more thinly among long sections of total non-interactivity, where all you're doing is watching a movie or reading a book instead of actually engaging with the game on a personal level. And that's not what interactive storytelling is supposed to look like. Good interactive storytelling isn't just good storytelling with a little bit of interactivity added in. You need, they need to be on the same page. You need to have the gameplay and the story as part of a whole. Um, so, unfortunately, we can't do that right now because the gameplay traditions are so rigid. So how do we make the gameplay, how do we make the gameplay of an adventure game less rigid? One, one solution can be found in Telltale Games' The Walking Dead, as well as a few more uh, recent uh, big-budget releases, where instead of being stuck with one gameplay tradition for the entire game, it switches back and forth between different gameplay traditions. In the case of The Walking Dead, it switches back and forth between multiple choice for high state, for uh, high fast-paced scenes and uh, point and click for slow-paced scenes. And that way, it gets to have whatever pacing it feels best fits for each scene. Another way that we can make the adventure game less rigid is by throwing out those traditions entirely. If we're not going to be using them for the entire duration of the game, and, or if it's a short game, then we don't need to rely on these tried and true traditions. We can make something new. You can see an example of this in Christine Love's wonderful game, Digital Love Story, where the interface is original. It puts you in the setting of a 1980s bulletin board system, which creates a very specific context for the story and puts you in a particular mindset to, in which to appreciate it. And it's, that game is not engaging in the same way that traditional adventure games are engaging. It's not challenging, it doesn't give you a sense of control over the story so much, but it is still engaging in a way that only a computer game can be engaging. So we see a roadmap for where the adventure game should be going in the future. When we put these two ideas together, you don't need to stick with one kind of gameplay for the whole game. But also, your gameplay doesn't need to be familiar. You can do new things. So instead of starting from, uh, from a point of, let's see what the adventure games have done before, we can start from a much more interesting point, storytelling-wise, which is who are our characters, what are they going through, what are the, what's specific to their current experiences, and how do we make that come across to the player. We've got a lot of ways to do that. We can do it by just giving choices which are, um, which are framed in the context of what the character, player character is thinking about. We can also do it in how we present those options, by using expressive interface design to put the player in a mindset of the situation, the way that uh, Digital Love Story did. 
We can ha use challenges to make the player feel that the character is being challenged. We can have sections where you're not challenged at all so that the player feels the character's boredom or lack of, uh, of interest in what's going on, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm going to show you a few ideas here, a few examples here of scenes which would be perfectly typical in any medium other than the adventure game and how you can do them in a dynamic interface where the gameplay keeps changing from moment to moment. So in scene number one, we have a woman who's getting ready for bed in her own home. She's going through the ritual of what she does to get ready for bed. It's not very thought-provoking, it's not very challenging, it's not tense, which means that the adventure game of today wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, but we can actually simulate the lack of tension. We can simulate the fact that she's not thinking about it too much. We can simulate the ritualistic aspect of it very simply by making it a to-do list. It's a to-do list of things that she needs to do before bed, lay out clothes for tomorrow, take a shower, use the toilet. And we can take out, and we get a sense of how thoughtless this is, how little she's thinking about the details, by taking out all the intermediary stages that you would expect in a text adventure. In a text adventure, you would be opening the door, walking into the room, uh, you know, doing all the, the little details which aren't that significant in her frame of mind. And instead, we can take that out. We can just say, take a shower, she takes a shower. That's the gameplay. Now, you might say that's not very sophisticated, that's not a very... Uh, it's not a very good system to have an entire game around. Well, no, it's not. But the next scene, we'll have a different kind of situation, so we can have a different kind of gameplay. She's sitting in bed uh, arguing about a book with her, with her wife. It's a casual, uh, casual conversation, but she's trying to argue about this book. She doesn't remember it so well, so you've got choices which are ambiguous. You don't actually know which is the right choice about why this was a bad book. All she remembers is very vague. Um, and you can decide to do that, but as a player, they'll feel tense. You don't really want to do that, so instead you can just say, kiss, kiss her, and don't worry about it so much. Um, and in this way, we have the nuances of this particular social situation reflected in the nuances of the interface. And that, in itself, is also not going to be for the entire game. In the next scene, we have the inciting event of the plot, where, uh, she, where she's interrupted by a phone call saying her great aunt in England is dying, and uh, she needs to get there right away, and suddenly she's overwhelmed by trying to figure out what is she going to do about this. She needs to get on a plane. She, where is she going? What's going to happen with work? Uh, why isn't her wife handing her a pen? She's gesturing for a pen. Why doesn't she understand this? So, all, and at the same time, she needs to listen to what's going on on the phone. So we can o simulate the overwhelming nature of this situation by making an overwhelming interface. We've got lots of windows which you need to multitask between, all of them having demands on the player. So by moving from one scene to the next and one kind of gameplay to the next, we can have gameplay which is as dynamic as the story that we're telling. And again, this is not meant to be for an entire game. In the next scene, we'll have something different. She'll go to England, and then she'll feel disoriented. And what could be better for that than a conventional text parser, which is all about what, figuring out what you're supposed to do next. And then when she gets her bearings, she'll have a different kind of interface. And after that, she'll get a different kind of interface. Maybe at some point in the story, she'll settle into a routine that'll make sense to have one kind of interface that we stick with for a while, but maybe not, whatever the story calls for. Now, once we start thinking like that, that we're going to do whatever the story calls for and not be limited by traditions, suddenly there are a lot of options on the table which we wouldn't have even thought of before. For instance, here we've got a murder investigation. Now, in a conventional adventure game, if the gameplay is about investigating, then every single scene is going to be about investigating. It doesn't matter what's going on, you're going to be looking at everything, you're going to be interrogating everyone around you, you're going to be solving puzzles and trying to make deductions, even if all you're doing is trying to get a taxi from one place to another. Um, and if we're making interfaces to suit the occasion, rather than trying to fit the occasion to the interface, then suddenly we can shake things up. The player genuinely doesn't know what, to ha what is going to happen. So in this case, we've got a lot of options on the screen that are clickable. They're all, uh, it's clear what's clickable because there are borders around them. And uh, so the player sees how many options there are. There are things that you can click on over and over again. Each time you click, it makes more detailed observations. You can, uh, you can chat with the butler. You can uh, ask questions, some of them. You can think about questions. Some of these questions are about, uh, are about the case, and some of them are about her life. What do I get my nephew for his birthday? Um, and so the player gets a sense this is going to be a long scene. By making a complicated interface, we've uh, defined a kind of pacing that the, play that the player is going to expect. And then we can suddenly surprise them, have her stabbed in the back by the butler, and change the, the, uh, and change the pacing by making a very simple interface. Now we've got only two options. One is to run for the door. One is to look at the knife in your back. 
Um, and because this isn't a cutscene, because we're still treating this as a part of the game proper, the, game, the player is still investing, still trying to figure out how do I get out of here, what the hell just happened, what happens next, and after this scene, he'll have no idea what is coming next, which is a great place to be in as storytellers. Um, now, we can simulate all sorts of things uh, in all sorts of ways. Here we have a, um, a young woman who is, uh, who is trying to ask a guy out on a date. Now, in a conventional, conventional point-to-click adventure, you would just have a choice, you know, ask him to go out with you, or possibly you'd have an inventory puzzle where you need to figure out what you need to give him so he'll go out with you. Here we can do something which actually captures the nervousness of the situation. We can do it in two ways. First off, the options of uh, what, you're, of what you, you're going to say next are not in a nicely ordered little list, which would make you feel comfortable, like it's all a very ordered situation. Instead, it, they're thrown all over the screen, and it feels chaotic, and you're not quite sure what you're looking at. But more importantly than that, we can frame it in a way that makes sense for her frame of mind. Instead of giving a full thought for her to, uh, for you to pick from, we give individual words. Yeah, okay, you, are, what's up? You know, individual words and phrases. They're going to be the next thing she says in the sentence. Um, and, the, and if here we took away the intermediary stages in order to make something feel thoughtless, here we're adding in intermediary stages in order to make it feel like it requires more effort. So suddenly, just by the nature of this interface, you get a keen insight into the, nat into the nature of the situation, which is uh, very specific to this character and this story. And it's not, it's not the next time she encounters this person, it's not going to be the same kind of gameplay again. Social situations change. Their social situations don't repeat themselves. When she meets him again, maybe they'll be in a more comfortable place in their relationship, and it'll be some other kind of interface, some other kind of gameplay. Uh, and that's what we can do with a dynamic interface. Uh, in scene number four, uh, here's a, a different kind of interface for a much more complex kind of situation. We have a character who's making a life decision, whether to stay with his sick father and look after him, or whether to take a nice job in another place where they'll need to fly away for. And uh, in a conventional game, you would just be given a binary choice. Do you go or do you stay? And that wouldn't give any impression of what is actually going on in his head. Um, because in a human being's head, you don't have binary choices. You have a preference. There's something which you actually feel like doing, and there's something which people are telling you to do or which you think you ought to be doing. And we can simulate that in gameplay as well as we can simulate the binary choice. So what's going on here is you've got uh, basically a solitaire card game where you've got different piles representing um, the arguments for leaving. And you've got a deck of cards at the bottom which reflect the different reactions, most of them negative, Toward these, toward these arguments. And you can pick up the cards, you can drag them into the piles, and form an argument for stay. Okay, so this isn't really a game about making a decision, it's a game about rationalizing. And that is a very, uh, you know, that's a nuance which we can capture when we create new, uh, new gameplay to suit the scene. Uh, one last example, since I see I have a little bit more time. Uh, I made a browser game a year ago called, uh, called Gamer Mom where I was uh, trying to uh, simulate emotions which I had had in my own life. And in, my case, in that case, the, uh, the experience of trying to connect with my family and failing due to personal failings. Um, and it's a very frustrating game. It's a very depressing game. And I did that by uh, giving a very, very challenging puzzle of trying to get uh, your family to play World of Warcraft with you. Um, and people would play it over and over and over again because I made it very deep uh, that you play it over and over again, different things happen. And I tell the player toward the beginning that it's not a trick puzzle, you can win. So people, what happened was that people got kind of addicted to it, and they would keep playing over and over again and try to figure out why, you know, how to get the family to play with it. And the more time they've invested, the more invested they are in getting the family to play. And after a while, they were right there in the mindset of a person who's trying to get their family to play with them and don't understand why it's not working. One of the best moments of my life was when my mother told me uh, that she had played this game and that she just wanted me to tell her how to get the family to play with her already. Um, and the point of this story is that uh, you can take moments from your own life. You can take experiences that you've had. You can look at, at the people that you know in the real world. And if you un really understand game design and how the nuances of shape uh, the player's experience, then you can simulate all of that in a game. You don't need to rely on what adventure games have done before. Are there any questions?
No. Uh, yes? Um, so, I mean, in the examples that you're talking about, how do you then avoid just making it, like, once you've got the second you test, making it a two-year-old test? Like, at the end, you get to two How do you avoid doing that? Like, if you, you know, after, the scene after the guy, you know, decides whether to go somewhere else. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's Excuse actually... Excuse me, sir. Can yeah. you please repeat, repeat your questions? Yes, okay. She's asking how you can avoid just going back to the standard traditions of choose your own adventure uh, after doing these, these moments. Um, because these are nice little moments, but you can't make an entire game out of them. Is that what you're saying? Basically. Or just, like, how do you take the mechanics you create? Yeah, well, in this, in this case, it's very, it's very straightforward. Um, next, uh, I, I imagine the next scene is going to have him talking to his father, um, who's going to be pushing him to go, actually. And uh, suddenly, all these things which you put in the piles are the cards which you're playing against him. Suddenly, it's a two-player card game. Okay? So then, in the end, he'll be going to the workplace, and then you've got some sort of interface that suggests the workplace environment, then you have him meeting people, and you've got these social interactions, and so on and so forth. It's a story. You can go places with it. Yeah. So, uh, it's a little beyond uh, an extension of that question. I like that you're coming up with sort of nuance and sort of slightly different interface elements or, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, constructs to be able to simulate certain emotions. It's great. But in the end, whatever emotion you're creating, this notion that you can somehow balance being freeform in the story, like letting like something explore, yeah. and yet not making it drudgery, like I still am not sure. Well, try, try playing the games, I think. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can you ask if you're yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, got it. Um, he's asking if you, can, uh, if you can avoid just making it feel like, uh, like drudgery and... Uh, I'm saying this, this solves one set of problems, but there's still the core problem of yeah. the adventure game. Well, no, but okay. He's asking if there's the core problem of the adventure game that it's, uh, it's, it feels like you're just figuring out what to do next, and it doesn't feel like an emotional journey. But the thing is, um, the reason that you need to have, uh, have every choice matter in the multiple choice game, or the reason that you need to have, um, that you need to have the, the feeling of disorientation in a text adventure, the point and click adventure game, is because you've got these very limited interfaces. Typing in a command is not in itself engaging. Uh, picking an option out of a list is not in itself engaging. But if you have interesting interfaces at all times, that is in itself engaging. That engages you in a way that only a computer game can. And, it engage, and if you keep shaking it up, then the player is going to be engaged just by seeing what they're being, what's being asked of them next. Yes? What do you tell the developer who may not have enough time to implement multiple interface styles? Uh, saying that they're going to rent this coming out of the game. How do you convince them? Right. So, you're asking about the practicalities of this and how you convince people to actually do this because I'll, I'll be honest here, this is a ridiculous amount of work. <laughs> my little game about simulating emotions for my own life took me like a year. Uh, I'd be faster now, but still, it's a ridiculous amount of work, which is probably the reason this hasn't been done yet. Still, I think this is something to strive for, at least. If you only have the resources to make a more conventional game, at least think of this, uh, think of the dynamic interface as a tool in your toolbox, where you don't need to be stuck in the same place all the time. Yes? Yeah. If you were to have a longer game, multiple different systems, each representing different scenes or emotions that the player was supposed to feel, how do you keep them interested in learning a huge amount of systems throughout the game? Right, so what he's asking is, uh, is that it takes a lot of effort to learn new systems, and how do you keep the player from getting frustrated by the process of continually learning over and over again how to play? But if you think about it, uh, in conventional adventure games, there's a lot of that too. Uh, in the point-and-click adventure game, you're always trying to figure out what you're doing next. Um, you're always trying to figure out puzzles. You're trying to figure out how the systems work. I think that's just an element that, uh, that's part of games that people like. They like learning things, and I, I don't see that they would get frustrated from it. Yes? Okay, you're asking if I've ever um, if, if I've ever seen the interfaces of games like Return to Zork from the early 90s. The answer is no. Um, but if you choose your emotional state, that it goes very much counter to what I'm describing here. 
uh, that's more like what you find in a lot of Western RPGs, where you get to define who your character is, what their attitude is toward the situation. What I'm describing here is not giving the player more freedom to decide who their character is. What I'm just, because then it's, it becomes very, very complicated to try to make sure that whatever they choose, you still have a good experience. What I'm actually describing is that the, that the game designer knows who the character is. He's got a very specific idea of who this character is. And you put the, uh, the player in the mindset of that very specific character. So, for instance, in Gamer Mom, I had a very obsessive character. Um, and the way that I got the player into that mindset was not ask, asking the player, how would you like to proceed? Would you like to ask them to play with you or not? I asked, how would you like to get the, your family to play with you? So that it puts them in the mindset not of, what am I doing? But, okay, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. How do I do it? So it's, it's a different sort of system. Yes, in the green. So it sounds like what you're describing with like the dynamic interface is this sort of basically having the game mechanics serve as sort of a means to experiencing the the um, narrative. But one potential to really see that, that idea is that like if if um, depending on the player, if it's a player that enjoys you know, experiencing eighteen percent mechanics and perhaps they're intrigued by the mechanics of a particular section of the game, but then it's sort of focused on something else. Like, how, how would you reconcile sort of people that are you know, experiencing your game? I understand. The question is how, how you, how you uh, accommodate players who are interested in a particular mechanic, which is a good question. Because, like, for instance, in this, uh, in this de detective story, I think the, uh, the investigation could easily, the way that I've set this up here, could easily be a game, and I specifically cut off the scene at the point where the player is going to start to get into it. So I've got two answers for that. Uh, first, if you like a certain mechanic, make a game with it yourself so that that game mechanic is the entire gameplay and it's not about the story. And then you can really explore the depths of possibility with that game mechanic. Um, if you're telling the story, it's not really such a great fit with that. And the second answer I have for that is tough luck. Yeah. Yeah. Your question is, don't I agree that story is key? Yes, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about saying the story is key and the gameplay should serve the story. But what I'm saying there is, I'm using it I understand the question. You seem to be asking. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's different mechanics and different interface. Mm -hmm. If you want to carry it when it's a carry adventure game, because people have changed our attention. Yeah. Okay, you're saying that that uh, that you don't think that this uh, this approach is enough to sustain the player's interest for the entire game, um, and and to keep adventure games, uh, you know, viable as a storytelling medium. I think the reason that uh, they're not viable as a storytelling medium is that they've gotten so stuck in the traditions that it's all about nostalgia now. And it's uh, getting a resurgence now because people want to have the games they played in their youth. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to say with certainty that you can do this for an entire story because nobody's ever tried it. So I haven't tried it yet. It's going, I'm going to do that at some point, but it's going to be a lot of work and it'll take me time. And this is still just the beginning of, of my thought process. So um, I can't tell you for sure that this is going to be enough. But I think if you have enough story there, if you have enough little moments, you can string them together in a game that's at least two hours long. No? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know in practice. People have to try it. Uh, I think that's all the time we have.